God, will y'all pray with me, please? Father God, we are so thankful that you are our Father. We're thankful that you just love us so much that you sent Jesus for us. Father, I'm, I'm thankful that we are not just a tribe, but we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're thankful for that. Lord, I just pray this morning uh, through our worship and through the teaching of your word and through our hearts as we listen for you, that we feel your spirit so strong today, that our souls are touched, our lives are changed, that we leave here today better than we were when we came in. Lord, I pray for strong spiritual nuggets that we can look at today and go, oh, yes, Lord, I will do that. I will do that. I need to do that. Lord, I'm sorry for that. Lord, I just pray that for me and all of us in this room and those who are watching online. Father, we, uh, I pray right now uh, for a heart that's ready to listen. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm in this series and uh, called Extraordinary Lives of Ordinary People. And I was always, as a young person, uh, I, I never had great confidence. I never had a, a, a lot of confidence. Uh, I tried a lot of things, and because I was an extrovert, I would, I, I would oftentimes step out of my comfort zone. But, but the bottom line was it wasn't until the day in my mid-20s when I seriously decided to chase after Jesus that my confidence, not confidence in myself, but my confidence based on my relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I knew how much he changed my heart. I knew how I looked at life different. And I knew that it, it just changed me. See, we're, we're one family. And, and one of the things that I love, well, I think the thing that I love probably most about church is that it's a place for us. You know, you know the church isn't this building. We say go to church, but we should probably say something like we gather with church, right? Because we are the church, and this is a place that we come that we know we're going to be encouraged. We're not just encouraged by the worship. We're not just encouraged by the Word of God, but we're encouraged by our encouragement for each other. It's one of the reasons why I love life groups so much. Our life groups start back today and, and this week. And, and that's a place where we do life together and encourage one another. I love uh, Romans 8.29. We're all familiar with Romans 8.28. Uh, but look at Romans 8.29. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them. Circle that. He chose them and then big circle this. To become like his son. You know what that means, right? You know what that means? It means we're God's children. Look at this next verse. The rest of this verse. So that his son would be the firstborn among what? Many brothers and sisters. Now, if you're here today and you've never really, uh, you're just checking God out and Jesus for the first time. And you're thinking, I don't know about that. I, I don't. Look, try it. Try it. If, if you've been feeling led to, to, to follow Jesus, then, then you just pray. You just ask God, God, would you just help me to understand? Would you bring your spirit on me and show me what I need to do? And, and Jesus said, just follow me. Just commit to following me. And when we do, when we do, we, we realize we're, we're not just a tribe, but we're a family. We're family. We're brothers from another mother, sisters from another mother. That's the way it works. That's the way it is. And that's why it's so important that we gather together because we have so much in common. We have so much in common because of Jesus. So I'm going to talk about one God, the father of one family, and I hope you just have your hearts ready to listen. If you're in here today and you're in discouraged. If you're, here, if you're in here today and you're lonely, you know, loneliness is really more a state of a mind and a heart than it is people. You know that, right? If you don't, it is. Because you've got to realize you have God with you all the time, even if you're completely by yourself. But sometimes we're most lonely when we're around other people. And that's why it's important that we realize as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're here to encourage one another. So some things that are important for us to know. First of all, go ahead to the next slide. First of all, we have one 
Father. We have one Father. Now, I've always found, you know, I, I, if you don't know, I was a therapist before I became a pastor, and, and, and I often talk to people about their relationship with their fathers. And men, I found over and over and over again that there's some messed up people back there all over who are messed up because of their relationship or lack of relationship or bad relationship with their father. So oftentimes when I would talk to a lady who'd been abused or, or, or used by her dad, and I talk about loving her father and God being her father, it was really, really... Matter of fact, one time, a girl, a lady actually said to me, I have a really hard time with God being father and you saying that he loves me. And that's because she was comparing God the father with God her earthly father. So it's important to realize that we have that, and we're, we're reborn into this new, this new place, this universal global family, God's family. With God being our Father, that makes us brothers and sisters. Then look what Peter writes, and this is, we did this last week. I'm in chapter 2 this week. But, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Now, this life could quickly end, right? Like, how many times have you known somebody perfectly healthy and like, Snuffed out, just like that. But when we're reborn spiritually, we're reborn into a life eternal. May not be here very long. It may be here till we're 120. Who knows with all the, the medication and people living longer. We may live to be 130. Well, I won't be, but maybe some of you younger people will be learned, will, will live to be, to be that, long, that old. Number two, we have the same battles and the same worldly temptations. We struggle with the same things that non-Christians do when it comes to temptation and, and doing things wrong. We, we struggle with that together. That's one of the reasons why it's so important when we talk to each other. You know, in our life group, I love that we got people that are at all levels of spirituality and, and spiritual maturity. And it's, it's awesome when we tell each other our story. It's awesome when somebody else is going through went through 10 years ago, something that we're going through right now to be able to hear how they handled that and, and the struggles that they had. But we have the same, we all have the same battles. Look what, Paul, look what Peter says in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, so get rid of all behavior, all evil behavior. Now, evil doesn't mean killing somebody's behavior, although it could be, but evil's anything from a lie to murder. That's evil. Anything that goes against God. If you're, if you're doing things that are against God. Now, I talk to Christians all the time, and they've got, and I have behavior. We have certain behaviors we do that we just go, you know, God will blow that one off. But let me tell you something. If you're struggling today, ask God to point out to you the things you blew off. The things you're doing that you need to change, that, that, that's, that's making you have a hard time connecting with God. Be done with all deceit. Be done with all deceit. Be, be done with all dishonor. Be done with all lies. Go back. Sorry. Nope. Go back to that last verse before that. So get rid of all be evil behavior. Be done with all deceit. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a Greek word for playing somebody on stage that you're not. Now let me tell you something. The number one reason people give for not following Jesus is they watch followers of Jesus and say they're hypocrites. They're not who they say they are. They, they don't live their life like they should be. They're not nice. I've, I've heard about Jesus. He was nice and he, and he was sacrificial. Um, the internet, social media, social media has made it to where more people all over the world can be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ than ever, ever before. So, if you're the enemy, what would you want Christians to be doing on the internet? Not being Christ-like, right? Not being Christ-like. You know if you are or not. It's easy to get caught up in your pride. Whatever side of the party you are politically, it's, it's real easy to get caught up in that. And when we do, we, we tend to get angry at the people that don't believe the same as we do. When we do that, the devil's going, yeah, you Christians, I got you. As long as I got you thinking about hating somebody else, you're not even going to feel God's love in your life. You know that, don't you? 
If you're hateful to someone else and, and, and you don't love other people, you're not going to feel God's love. It doesn't mean God's abandoned you. It means you've put up this wall between you and God. So, so the devil right now, one of his greatest tools, maybe the greatest tool, is when Christians are tools on the internet. You know what I'm saying? It's important. You got to weigh. You got to think about what you say. You got to think about how you present yourself, especially as a follower of Jesus Christ. If one day you're checking into Life Connection Church and the next day you're trashing people that Jesus Christ died for, you need to rethink that. If you want me to check out your site, you just call me and I'll look at it and I'll mark it. Give me permission to mark it. I'm just kidding. Fix it yourself. Next. We all have the same God, and we're, that means we all are given the same spiritual goal. We're all, we're, you know what our goal is for ourselves. Now, we know our mission is to go and make disciples. You know what our goal is for ourselves? If somebody was to say to you, what's your goal for yourself as a Christian? It's spiritual maturity. It's spiritual maturity. I mean, you guys know, not all adults act like adults. And not all Christians act like spiritual, spiritual mature Christians. And matter of fact, when I used to work with youth, it used to blow me away with how many teenagers I knew that were more spiritually mature than a lot of adults that I knew. You know, that's our goal. That's our goal. That's the goal of the church. As a matter of fact, the, my job description is to build us as a church toward maturity. That's my job description. That's why I teach the Word of God. That's why we do small groups. That's why we do different things. We serve the community. All of those kind of things we do, we do those to, to help us grow up to be uh, mature believers. And we have to look at it. Look at this verse. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into full experience of salvation. Now... <laughs> You know, when you get a, a, a baby and you're holding that baby and, and, he, and it's milk or formula or whatever is the, the thing that babies drink. And it's so funny when you stick that, there, you know, and, and when, when your wife's not looking, you move the nipple around and you watch the baby. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm, I know y'all did that. Don't lie to me. I know y'all did that. We, we do that, right? And, and they're just craving. They're just craving that milk. But as newborn Christians, and here's what I've seen. Oftentimes, somebody decides to follow Jesus Christ, and, and it goes along a little while, and, and as soon as they've hit a couple of bumps or something bad has happened to give them kind of a bad taste for God, they forget that Jesus Christ died for us. And at first, they're just craving. They can't wait to hear a message. They can't wait to hear worship music. They, they just can't wait. But, but they stop. Because as we, as we use and grow with this spiritual milk, then we grow into the, this may sound weird to you, the experience of salvation. Circle that. And if you want to write something beside it to remind you what that means, it's not just fire insurance it's not just to keep you out of hell spiritual uh, experience of salvation is the full out of experience of of God being involved in your life do you remember when you were young you remember when you're young and you just couldn't I couldn't wait to be 18 I just couldn't wait and it took forever, and, and I kept wanting to be 18 and have the privileges of being 18, but I couldn't be that. And that's the difference in physical age and spiritual age. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, a, a young man who was pastoring churches that Paul had started, and he just said, you know, Timothy, it doesn't matter how young you are physically. It's the spiritual maturity. It's the spiritual maturity maturity that you've got to to be you've got to grow into God gives us what we need to be spiritually mature if you want to write this right beside or right by that verse he gives us Jesus which makes us um which takes away the wall between us and God by by having our, our sins forgiven he gives us a Holy Spirit where we can practice God's presence and and we can we can remember um what God wants us to do, and, and he counsels us in what God wants us to do. 
He gives us the word of God. The word of God. And, and, and here's, here's what I found about the word of God. The spirit will use it different according to what your needs are. Quick example. Uh, one of the first times I ever preached, I was working at a church in Maryland. I was associate pastor. When I came there, they told me I was going to be preaching about five times a year. And uh, the first time I was going to preach, I wrote my message. I worked on it all week long. And, and then I was in my, in my office and I went over it like I preached it like three times in my office. And, I'm, and it, this is the most ready I'm going to possibly be. Now, while I was practicing, because I always have my notes. I'd always, I've always done notes. I've always done the kind of notes that y'all have. Well, while I was practicing, something came to mind. I don't even remember what it was. That's how minute it was to me. That's how it wasn't that important to me. Something came to mind that, that I was supposed to say right there, maybe, and I didn't know. I'd never done this before, so I just wrote it down beside. Just wrote it down beside it. And I thought, when I get there, if I feel like the Spirit leads me, I'm going to say that. Okay, like I said, I don't remember what it is for me. And I'm preaching along, and I come to that place in my notes, and I see that thing written there, and I felt like God told me to say it. And I said it. Again, it wasn't enough to me to really remember what it was. And I'll just tell you, as one of my first times to preach, I, I walked down that day just discouraged. Oh, that was awful. That was terrible. I must have sounded like an idiot. I must have, whatever. And, and no one's coming up and pat me on the back. My first time to teach at this church, and no one's coming up and going, you, got, you guys, you lie to me every week. Good message, Royal. Good message, Royal. Way to go. And, and I'm walking out, and, and all of a sudden, one of the elders' wives walked up to me. And she has been boohooing, obviously. And she says, you know what, Royal? When you said that, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. That was for her, you know? And that's why you'll get different things. That's what's so cool when we come together as life groups and we discuss the message. You look in your uh, bulletin today and you've got group notes. And those group notes are asking questions. And there's other scripture that I brought in. from. But, but that's what it's all about. That, and, and then the church. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Word, and the church, those are the things we need to mature. You have to have the church to mature. My whole life I've heard people say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Can I just tell you something? There are over 50 times in the New Testament we're told to do something together. So how can you be obedient without being in church? You know what I'm saying? That, that's, it's, it's important. We need, we need to cry out. For this nourishment. Oh God, please help me. People tell me all the time, you know, Royal, I read the Bible and I, I just can't understand it. First of all, make sure it's not the King James Version. I never understood anything William Shakespeare wrote. The, the, uh, the, the King James Version was written in the 1600s. It's just not our language, you know. Some people think that's the only Bible. I heard a guy say one time that the King James Version was good enough for the Apostle Paul. It's good enough for me. By the way, it wasn't around until 1600. So, so get a, I like teaching out the New Living Translation. Most of the scripture you have in here. And then on top of that, people ask me all the time, well, what, what's a Bible study I can get? You order off Amazon or wherever you want to get it. Get a New Living Translation study Bible. And at the bottom of those study Bibles, it'll, you'll go, what does that mean? In our life group, when we come to something, I'll ask somebody with a study Bible, what's it say on the study Bible about that? Because I'm not a genius. I don't know everything theologically. But cry out for that nourishment. And so, so you get a Bible you can understand, and then you get a heart that will understand. Heavenly Father, please, um, first of all, ask for forgiveness. Man, I've messed up a few times today. God, and whatever I've done to hurt anybody or, or hurt you... I'm sorry for that, and I don't want to do that. Would you help me understand your word today? Would you? I'm going to tell you something. If you come to church that way, if you get in, when you get here in the parking lot, you stop for a minute and go, Lord, I want to prepare my heart to go in and worship. And and Lord, would you forgive me for what I've done this week? Would you give me a fresh start today? Would you Would you help me to understand what I need to understand from the worship today and from the teaching of your word? Ah. <sighs> You know, you drive up with your kids in the car and, and you're screaming at each other. 
and you scream at the kids, if I have to get back there, you know what I'm saying? And then you open up, we open up the car door and we step out on the church parking lot. We go like this to, you know, you got to get prepared to go in and listen to the word of God. So cry out for nourishments. Cry out for Jesus. Cry out for the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Cry out for his word to mean something to you. And then commit to it. And then cry out for the community of faith. That will change the way you worship. It will change the way you interact with God. Cry out for more than what you're doing now. Now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Golly, we get that sense of emotion and we get baptized and, and then we go out into the world where nobody else is acting like God wants us to ask, act. And it's so easy to just go, okay, I'll just go along with what everybody else is doing. But, but you should be changing daily. You should be, mature, you should be maturing as you go along. Now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness, let me just ask you something. Just you, it's between you and me, or you and God right now. Would, have you matured spiritually in the last year or not? Because if you're the same, you're really going backwards. Does that make sense? Have you matured? You're the only one keeping you from maturing. Because Jesus is there, the church is there, the Holy Spirit is there, they're, they're all, the Word of God is there, all those things to help you mature. Now, if you're thinking, yeah, I think, I think I have, then here's the next thing to do. Honey, do you think I've matured spiritually this year? And then give him or her permission to kindly tell you whether they think you have or not. It may not work. Y'all may have to call me and I'll have to give you a counselor. But, but, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, important. it's important to understand that. We are the living stones of God's house. We are the living stones of God's house. See, this is just a building. This is just a building. Uh, we could be meeting outside. We could be meeting at the lake around a picnic table. We, we could be meeting anywhere, but the church is us. The cool thing about this church and, and why we built this building is it created a place, a natural place for us to come and worship together. In the Acts 2 church, when church first started, uh, after Jesus had resurrected and, and after Peter had got up and he gave the first evangelistic message and thousands of people came to know the Lord, then it said that they were meeting in the temple and they were meeting in homes. So there's a purpose for the building. The temple was a building. It was a place they went to worship God. It, and and that's, why, that's why we're here. That's why we do it. But we're the living stones. We're the living stones of God's house, God's spiritual house. Look at this. You are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. The living cornerstone. You know, the cornerstone is a, it's the first stone that's set in the construction of a building. And all other stones are set to reference that stone. So if Jesus is our cornerstone, then, then, then we come together and we all have different gifts. We all have different amounts of money. We all have uh, different pasts. We've all got different experiences. And we bring all those things together and hook on to the cornerstone of Jesus. And then God uses us. Some of you in here, all of you in here, there are people you can minister to that would never listen to me either because of the color of my skin or the color of my hair or how old I am or whether they think I'm grappy or, or because I'm a pastor or whatever. But you can. You can. And again, that's one of the things we, set, we share with each other in our life groups. We're, this living, we're the living stones of the church. That's why it's so cool. When I've been watching people come in after they hadn't been to church in a while. Didn't it feel good to come in here today? Oh, I've been watching you on Facebook going, I can't wait to go back to church. I can't wait to go back to church. And that's where, that's where people, we all relate to each other because we have the same father. We have the same father. He was rejected by people, his own people, his own people. He was rejected by when he came, Jesus. But he is chosen by God. I'm sorry. But he was chosen by God for great honor, great honor. Jesus came to earth, became a human being.
for us, for us. And he was given great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Isn't that amazing? Do you ever think of yourself that way or do you just think I'm going to church? I'm just going to church. Because here's what living stones do. Living stones, when they leave the church building, they do church in their job. They do church in their neighborhood. They are the living stone that's out there. Because our job is to build a bigger spiritual building. Not structural building. Our job is to build and make disciples. That's where making disciples come in. Next, we are holy priesthood. We are a holy priesthood. Look what Peter writes. He says, What's more, you are his holy priest through the mediation of Jesus Christ. You offer spiritual sacrifices that what? All right. Well, what the heck? If that word offends you, I apologize. What is, what is a spiritual sacrifice? What's a spiritual sacrifice? It's, um, it's reaching out to someone who has been terrible to you and forgiving them. It's loving somebody who's never done anything in your mind or anybody else's mind to be loved. It's it's. Honoring and respecting the position of your boss, even though everybody else in the room is against him and they think you're a brown noser. Those are spiritual sacrifices. And you can think of other ones. Spiritual sacrifices are the things that we do in faith that God wants us to do. That's a spiritual sacrifice. That's, that's, that's like if you were physically even stronger than if you were physically getting some kind of animal and, or doing something and sacrificing it on the altar. You're sacrificing yourself. When you do something that's a, sac- that's a spiritual sacrifice, they please God. It's the things you do that please God. We have been chosen to be part of his family. We have been chosen to be part of his family. Look at the next part of this verse. For you are a chosen people. You know what that means? That means you didn't just wake up and go, I'm going to go find God. That would be, I wonder if there's a God. No, look, here's what happens. Scripture says because we're physical beings, we don't naturally do things spiritually. So it's the draw of the Spirit. It's God drawing us. Now, a lot of us don't answer the draw. A lot of, and some of us will answer the draw, make a commitment, and then back off and you know, and, and when that happens, you've got to ask yourself, have I really made that commitment to following Jesus Christ? Also, we're a holy nation. We're a nation within a nation. You know that? I love Texas, but I love the nation of Jesus Christ. You know? You watch people, I, I get on, during a Cowboy game, I get on Facebook and I'm commenting on the game and I'll put Cowboy Nation, hashtag Cowboy Nation. We're holy nation. We're hashtag holy nation. That's who we are. What's a holy nation do? We work for God. In every situation we're in, we work for God. We are a holy nation. You are royal priests. I love that title, right? Royal priests. You are royal priests, God's holy nation. That's what you are. That's what I am. Remember, the apostle Paul is writing this to Christians who are being killed but for their faith. They're being persecuted greatly by the government for their faith. Jewish Christians are being persecuted by Jews who haven't followed Christ yet. And he's saying, you're royal priests. You're God's holy nation. Number eight, we were created by God and we belong to him. We were created by God. Look at verse nine. We are God's very own possession. Now, How much do you think a beat-up old Cadillac is worth? Let's just say a 67 Cadillac. Let's just say a beat-up. My first car was a 67 Cadillac, four-door, sedan deville with with now this was a 12, 10-year-old car. You can you could uh, that had these little you could put your feet down on the footstools and had these little tables, and you could put 20 guys in there and everybody put in 50 cents and we could drive around all night long. You know what I'm saying? 
Now, what would you think a 67 beat-up old Cadillac would be worth right now? What do you think? $200, $500, maybe it was clean, $1,000. What if it was owned by Elvis Presley? Yeah, it'd go up quick, right? Right? What, what if it belonged to John F. Well, it wouldn't be John F. Kennedy because he died before 6 a.m. You know what I'm talking about. You know where I'm going because the worth is based on the possession. Whose is it? Now, what if you're owned by the God of the universe? What does that do to your worth? How do you feel about yourself? It's nothing you can be proud of. It's not anything you did. It's something you're grateful for. And if you're grateful and loving for it, then you're able to give away the grateful and loving. You're not going to be jealous if someone else becomes the possession of God. Isn't that amazing? How do you feel about yourself? You are owned by the God of the universe. And the day you start living your life that way, not in pride, but in gratitude, will be the greatest day of your life. Because the rest of your life will be an amazing adventure. In your job, in your home, in in anything that you do. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. See, you're owned by the God of the universe. You're not jealous. You're not worried. You don't have to compare yourself against anybody else. You can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. You know, light is warm, right? And we're not real excited about warm right now. But, but, but light is warm, and light gives you clarity, and light lets you see things. Light lets you know, ooh, that's evil. Stay away from that. Ooh, that's good. This is a spiritual sacrifice for God. That's what the light does. That's what the light does. We have received God's mercy. We have received God's mercy. God forgives us. God doesn't punish us. Sometimes. Now don't forget, just because we have God, we have God's mercy. We have God's mercy, and so I believe in once saved, always saved. Now I know there are religions or churches, Christian churches out there that teach that that's not true, but but if you want to know that, let me know, and, and I'll show you some references to let you know that. But But because we've been given eternal life, and because we've been given God's mercy, we, we may have to live through some stuff that we screw up, right? Now, you, you lost your marriage because of your behavior and her or his behavior, and, and, and that's a struggle, and, and, and God's not going to keep you out of heaven because of that. But you may have to fix the relationship with your ex. It's good for your children, even if you're both remarried, right? Let me tell you something. If, if tomorrow you started, you just decided, I'm going to get along with my ex, for most of you that have to do that, that would be a spiritual sacrifice. That would be something you did to honor God. That's a spiritual sacrifice. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Your, your worth has gone up exponentially. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Remember, he's talking to these people who are being so uh, treated so terrible because of their faith. And number 10, we should respond to God by staying on mission. And that's my last point. We, we have to be aware of the temptations to do wrong and avoid them. And avoid them. There are things that we play with. We just kind of play with. Whether you're watching things on a screen. Or uh, flirting with the lady at the office. I want to tell you something. I'll just tell you something. I was a therapist for four or five years. I never once had a guy uh, who had messed around on his wife. Or a girl that had messed around on her husband. That came in and said. You know I just couldn't wait to mess around on my husband. I just couldn't wait. I've been looking for that guy to fool around with. No, I heard over and over again. I never thought that would happen. Can I tell you something? If you're a lady in here today and and you're not getting along with your husband very well and you're really kind of struggling, you become a target at your office. Men can see that you're struggling. They just can. They're just, they just, 
they just even the married men, they just come in and they start flirting with you. They tell you your hair is nice and you're thinking, my husband didn't even notice I got a haircut. He didn't even notice it's purple now, you know. And all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, people, people do like me. Men, if you're not treating your wife like she's the most special thing on the planet, start today, please. And ladies, give him permission to do that. When he starts being nice, don't go, oh, what are you hiding now? You know what I'm saying? I mean, just it, it's important. But you've got to be aware of the temptations that will make you do things wrong or you will choose to do things, choose to do things wrong. Dear friends, I warn you, as temporary residents and foreigners, remember, our, where's our real place? Where's our real home? It's heaven, right? To keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. It's not just a stressful mind thing. It's not just hiding things from your spouse. It's, it's not just hoping your boss doesn't find out. It's against your very souls. It's messing with you. You won't even feel God's presence. You pray and it doesn't seem to go anywhere. You, you just struggle all the time. And why does this keep happening to me? And, and you start going down. And, and oftentimes what will happen is you'll get to a certain point and God will break you. He'll break you. Just like the shepherd, the sheep won't stop running away, and he has to break the leg and carry him to keep him out of trouble. That's what it's all about. Be a good neighbor to your pre, pre-believing neighbor. Here's three things that are important for us to do. Be, be a good neighbor to your pre-believing neighbor. Be, be the best. Be the best. It doesn't matter if they're a jerk or whatever. You be the best that you could possibly be. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Second one. Oh, here's the scripture. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Next one, please. Be a good witness in your relationship with Christ. You know what a witness is. A witness experiences something. You're, you're a witness as to what it's like to walk into Life Connection Church and come in here and sit down and wear masks and all that. You're a witness to that. You experience that. Well, people want to see your experience with God. I'm, you're a Christian. What does that mean? You seem to be a really good person. Or you're one of those people that they're talking about on Facebook that are jerk Christians that give Jesus a bad name. That's your witness. And if you, if you can't talk to people about your experience, you know, I can't, I can't tell you about my experience with a movie if I haven't seen it or if I slept through it. If you're sleeping through your faith, you can't tell anyone anything, but, well, I got saved in seventh grade, and that doesn't carry any water. Well, I'm going to go to heaven one day. Heaven means nothing to earthly people. Change is what people You ever see a commercial that it doesn't say, it's going to make your life better? Every commercial. You'd be pretty dumb if you went. There's there's one commercial right now, Emu emu Lotion. It's for sores and whatever. And it's, I think, the tagline, it makes you feel better and it doesn't stink. That's a pretty good tagline, isn't it? I mean, that's good. It makes me feel better and it doesn't stink. Be in a good relationship with Christ. You are a witness Good or bad witness. You are a good or bad witness. You're a witness no matter what. If you're a Christian, you're a witness. You're either a witness to I'm somebody that hasn't had a very good relationship with Christ or I'm somebody that does have a very good relationship with Christ. How about you? Are you living that life as a child of God? Do you realize that who you are, what you're worth It's not based on you, it's based on whoever owns you. You may be beat up, you may be old, you may have been through hell in the last couple of years and you just thought God must not care about me anymore. I remember when I used to get along with God, I remember when I loved going to church, I remember I I loved praying and I just don't feel that way. Well look, how you feel doesn't matter. You're still so valuable that Jesus Christ died for you. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for how much you love us. And Lord, I just pray for each of us. If there's someone in here today or somebody online that's thinking, I want that Jesus, that's the Jesus I want. Lord, I pray that today, today that they tell you that they need you, 
that today they thank you for Jesus and that today they decide to follow you for the rest of their lives. And for those of us in here today, Lord, that are following you, I pray that we realize how valuable we are, not because we've earned anything, but because you gave your son for us. I thank you for that. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much. I'll see you next week.